uh, Grabars, uh, who is an agricultural marketing inspection representative, um, and Mr. Simon Lavasque, who is a property agent in the Farmland Preservation Program. Uh, both of them are at the Connecticut Department of Agriculture. They're going to be discussing the Farm Transition Grant and the Farmland Restoration Grant, uh, both of which are publicly funded grants through the Connecticut Department of Agriculture. So we want to give everybody the opportunity to ask questions, and we also want to give the speakers opportunity good enough time to answer those questions. So if you could hold your questions till the end, um, write them down. If the speaker happens to answer it later on in their presentation, then your question's good. And if not, then uh, there'll be time at the end of each presentation to ask them. Um, so without further ado, I would like to welcome uh, Miss Ellery. Ali Rose Grabars to tell us everything about the uh, grant. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Thank you to everyone in the Farmer Veter Veteran Coalition for having us tonight. We're very excited to share some information with you. Let me share my screen. Okay, can everyone see this? Fantastic. Um, so, Hello, everyone. My name is Allie Rose. I work at the Department of Ag. Um, I just started there last October, so I've been there for a little over a year now. Um, in addition to my managing the Farm Transition Grant, I also manage our Farm Viability Grant, which is geared towards municipalities, nonprofits, and councils of governments. Um, and I also oversee our Organic Cost Share Program. So if you're an organic producer, send me an email and I'll get you a uh, involved in that program as well. So again, my name is Allie Rose. My email is up on the screen and I'll have it again in the presentation a little bit later if anyone wants to email me about their specific project or um, any questions that aren't answered tonight. If you think of something later, feel free to send me an email. Okay, so before I really dive into the information on the transition grant, I first wanna start by saying that all DOAG grant opportunities can be found on our grants portal. Uh, right now, we actually have a number of them open. In addition to transition and restoration, we also have the CT Grown for CT Kids grant and the Food Policy Capacity Building grant. Those are both also open right now. Um, so if you're interested in learning more about those, check out the portal, go to our website. We have lots of information available. Um, because we have a lot of grant programs uh, from our department, you know, a good way to stay up to date on those when they're opening, when they're closing, when they're coming soon, um, is to subscribe to the weekly agricultural report. Um, so we release that every Friday, and it includes not only um, grant information from DOAG, but also um, if NRCS is doing something, USDA has a grant open, uh, we include information on that as well. So the Farm Transition Grant, something to keep in mind um, before you apply is that it is a reimbursement grant, which means that when you are awarded an, a grant amount, um, the money comes at the end after the project has already been completed. Um, so when you apply, you know, keep that in the back of your mind that going into the project, um, you are the financial sponsor of the program through completion. Once it's completed and you submit your final report, then I'm able to issue the payment of your grant award. Something else to keep in mind is that most DOAG grants require a cash match percentage, which means that based on the total cost of your project, you are also responsible for contributing some sort of percentage to the project um, and your grant amount will make up the other percentage. And anyone who's looking to apply, they should be in good standing with the Department of Agriculture, the Secretary of State, and federal requirements. Um, I, as I said, I'm going to be going through a lot of information. If you know you want to take this time to kind of digest and listen to this information, I have lots of documents that you can read through available on our website. Um, if you Google Connecticut Department of Ag, pull up our website page right on the home page, it has um, some nice links. And the Farm Transition and Farm Restoration Grants are right in that uh, main page. So you can feel free to view a guidance document that really walks through the specifics of the grant requirements, um, who's eligible, the submission process. Um, it has it all written down. It's also available in Spanish if, 
if you'd prefer to read that, um, those are all available on the website. So the application period for this grant, it opened on November 1st, and it will continue to be open until January 11th of 2023 at 4 p.m. The main goal of this grant program is to provide matching funds to Connecticut farmers or agricultural cooperatives. Um, and we're looking for farms that are looking to diversify their existing operations, uh, transition to value added agricultural production and sales and other avenues in which a majority of your products are sold. Most of the products that you sell are grown in the state. Um, and uh, statute wise, Funding for the Farm Transition Grant Program is provided through the Community Investment Act, which allots us $500,000 annually in the fiscal year to award to farms and agricultural cooperatives. So who is eligible? I feel like I've said farmers and agricultural cooperatives a lot, but just to reiterate, um, and some more detail specific um, elements to make sure you have, um, you should possess your farmer's tax exemption permit or at least have submitted the application to receive your permit if you are a new farmer. Um, if you're a new farmer and you haven't yet applied for your permit, um, you would do this through the Department of Revenue Services at the state. And the only requirement to be able to receive this permit is that you have recorded $2,500 of sales for the year um, directly as your farm business, or if you're working as a DBA or a sole proprietor, as long as you've recorded $2,500 in sales for the year, you are eligible to apply for that permit. If you are a limited liability corporation or an incorporation, uh, that business should be registered with the Secretary of State and sole proprietors or doing business as DBAs are also eligible to apply. So the transition grant program consists of four different subcategories. Um, to determine which you should apply for, we first need to look at your production history. Um, if you're just entering the agricultural industry and you have between one to three years of production history, you're eligible to apply for our new farmer micro grant. If you have at least three years of production history, then you are able to apply for our other three categories, infrastructure, research and development, innovation and diversification. If you are just on the brink of meeting a full year, or you're not sure exactly when you should consider you know, your business start date, so feel free to send me an email and I can talk through the specifics with you um, and let you know if you should apply. So the New Farmer Micro Grant, as I said, this is for producers with one to three years of production history. It has a $5,000 maximum award and it requires a 25% match. So just to reiterate what this means is that the grant funds will cover 75% of eligible expenses up to $5,000. That other 25% is your contribution to the project. Uh, most awardees of this category, they're looking to buy small ag equipment, uh, small buildings, irrigation, uh, small greenhouses, coolers, um, mostly just they need to, they're looking to expand their business. They're looking to produce more. What sort of equipment can they purchase to get that done? So some previously awarded projects. In 2021, DeLuca Family Farm, they purchased a corn planter and Walden Farm purchased a plastic mulch layer and drip irrigation. So because, you know, I hate to say that the maximum award is small because $5,000 is no small amount. Um, before these sorts of projects, it's mostly I'm looking to buy this piece of equipment and that's the whole project and that's perfectly fine. If that's all you're looking to do, that's awesome. Some tips if you are going to apply for this category, um, you know, as I said, don't apply with something that requires you to contribute a huge cash amount. You know, if you want to, if you're in your second year of production and you want to build a two story barn, you know, $5,000 will contribute some, but it will not help a lot for that project. You know, it's better to start small and next year when the pool of money expands, you know, quadruples, that's the time to apply for that. And sort of going along with that, you know, a competitive project doesn't have to request the full $5,000. If you have uh, a piece of equipment that you could buy for $2,500 and you want to apply, 
for you know 75% of that to be paid by grant funds, I encourage you to do that. You know, we like to say, you know, don't have the budget uh, or the, don't have the project fit the budget, have the budget fit your project. You know, there's no need to add other things to it. Um, and lastly, you know, tell us why this equipment purchase is necessary for your farm to succeed long term. As a new farmer, you know, we want to support people who are looking to get involved in the industry and stay there. Um, so just tell us why it's necessary and how it'll help you in the long run. Infrastructure. So this is by far the most popular and the most competitive category. Um, it's a $20,000 maximum award and there's a 50% match requirement. Um, most people looking to apply to this category are looking to purchase pasture or livestock fencing. They're looking to remodel their barn, expand their barn, or even build a new one. They wanna purchase um, higher capacity ag specific equipment high tunnels, greenhouses, hydroponic equipment, irrigation, processing equipment. It really can be, there's a huge range of things that you can purchase with this, as long as it's related to ag production. Um, so let's see, 2021 Fort Hill Farm, they're getting very big into sustainable agricultural practices. Um, they purchased a no-till grain drill, a cover crop roller, and a culture adapter for water wheel transplanter. So you can see you know, the scale of these projects. It goes from purchasing one piece of equipment to maybe three for the maximum amount that you can be awarded. Um, Cloverleaf Farm, they purchased, installed, and outfitted a propagation greenhouse on their farm. Um, and something I like to tell people to keep in mind is you can apply for just the greenhouse, um, but if the greenhouse isn't going to max out your budget, you know, what do you need to be able to utilize the greenhouse? What other things, what materials or supplies would you need to be able to use this? Um, and so when she applied, Susan also included um, the landscape fabric and the materials to build her, land, uh, her greenhouse table. So depending on where um, your budget falls, you know, if you can think of, you know, I really can't use this greenhouse without X, Y, Z, include that in your project. So tips for applying for infrastructure. Um, as I said, you should make the connection to ag very clear. Um, also include, will this allow you to sell to additional markets? Will you be able to maybe wholesale a portion of your harvest? Or would you maybe visit twice as many farmers markets during the season if you were able to produce, increase your production? Um, all of that is very important, and that shows us that, you know, you'll produce more, and you'll sell more, and you'll be uh, successful in the long run. Be sure to include quotes for any work that you're planning to have done by subcontractors in your budget. Um, in addition to that, for any equipment purchases, um, really purchasing anything online or from an equipment dealer, um, anything that requires a shipping cost, uh, the shipping costs are included, those can be covered by grant funds. It is a lot easier to you know, show, I ordered this piece of equipment and it was shipped to my house and I assembled it, than it is for you to maybe lower the cost of purchasing by you going to pick up the equipment. It's a lot harder to justify that your trip to pick up the equipment is related to this. Um, so I say, have it shipped to your house, have it included right in the, um, the purchase price. And as I said before, don't make the project fit the budget. The budget should fit your project. Okay, the next category is research and development. So here the maximum award is $25,000 and the match is 40%. Uh, these sorts of projects, they're looking to pay marketing consultants, uh, purchase equipment to pilot a product or a concept, um, any expenses related to exploratory product development, including fees associated with product, recipe, and market testing. Um, a previously awarded project um, just last year, Harmony Sea Farm, they wanted to test um, two size cultures of um, butter clams, and they wanted to see um, which would be better received by local chefs in the area, what would they be looking to incorporate into their menus. 
as well as what would customers be interested in purchasing. So they purchased the supplies to sort of run this experiment to culture um, the clam seeds, two different sizes, 15 millimeters or six millimeters. Um, and in addition to using those inputs, um, they also wanted to um, distribute marketing cards and surveys to sort of get some feedback from the local chefs and customers. Um, and so it's, these projects are essentially their experiments. We want to see, you know, what sort of inputs do you need to run this experiment? What do you need to measure your outcomes and make your decision of um, which product you'd like to market in the future? Um, another similar project was the Stonington Kelp Company. Um, they wanted to conduct recipe testing to create a value-added kelp product. Um, and to do so, they needed to rent a commercial kitchen space. They purchased packaging materials for the product. They were planning to hire a designer to create labels for the finished product. And as well, they were planning to bring these different recipes of this product to various farmers markets, have people test samples, give feedback on which they preferred, which they would be most likely to purchase in the future. Um, and that's how they were going to be evaluating uh, the interest on this product. So tips for this category. Um, as I said, you know, you're essentially applying to conduct an experiment. So make sure you explain the experiment. Tell us what sort of variables will you be testing? Uh, what will you do with the um, conclusions that you draw from the feedback or from the measurements that you get at the end? Um, show that all of the project inputs that you're looking to purchase are necessary to conduct the research. Um, for example, Harmony Sea Farm, they were going to need a cooler to be able to store uh, the clams um, before they were able to bring them to the markets. That fits, that equipment um, is part of the project. Um, and as I said, any equipment necessary to interpret results can also be purchased. If you need any sort of equipment, um, if you're fermenting vegetables, you're canning vegetables, you need a pH meter, anything like that, that can also be included uh, to be eligible to be paid for by grant funds. Okay, so the last category is the innovation and diversification category. So this has the largest maximum award of $49,999, and it requires a 50% cash match. So for this category, we're looking for projects that'll allow you to expand your product offerings. Um, if you need to purchase value added processing equipment to produce something new, um, equipment that will assist in diversification of your farm products, construction of a farm store or a processing kitchen, any sort of innovative technology or software, and as well, marketing and outreach to promote your new product, service, or market. And the key for this category is that we wanna see you produce something new at the end of this um, project. We wanna see you offer a new service or sell to a new market. We wanna see something new happening. So for example, in 2020, the Muddy Feet Flower Farm, uh, they applied to construct a 26 by 30 post and beam barn. And you might be thinking, you know, what, what's new about doing this? And that's why when you're writing your application, it's really important to sort of expand on, you know, I'm going to be building this barn, but what am I going to be doing with it? So the way that this project fit under innovation and diversification, rather than just being an infrastructure project, is that before this construction project had taken place, the barn was only used for equipment storage and farm visitors could not enter. But upon completion of this project, uh, they were able, they were planning to host flower arranging classes on the farm and as well as incorporate a space to hold a farm store. So if you're thinking about you know, doing some sort of building, um, buildings can be very useful for equipment storage. You know, a lot of farms just need a place to put things, you know, to keep their uh, machinery um, in good condition. They need somewhere to put it. And so when you want to build a building to do that, you sort of have to think at least in terms of this application, you know, what else could I do? Could I host a seasonal pop-up market where people can come uh, buy my products on the farm? You know, what if I do that every few months? That is something that could allow you to not only build a barn to hold your equipment, but also use that space to do something innovative, to do something different. 
And so that sort of uh, element would allow you to apply for the innovation and diversification category. So previously awarded projects, um, Steadfast Farms, they constructed and outfitted a poultry processing facility in Bethlehem. Um, I know you guys are very uh, well in touch with Jared. Um, this was a great project, very innovative. As we all know, um, processing facilities are very limited in number in Connecticut. Um, so this was a great project to sort of meet that need and as well as be an innovative, um, innovative addition to the products that they offer. Um, on the farm. Uh, just this past grant round, the Birch Mill Farm Partnership, they purchased a no-till grain drill. And this is another sort of situation where you think, you know, how is that innovative? Um, in addition to purchasing and using the drill on their own farms, they were going, they are offering custom cropping services to other farms throughout Northwest Connecticut. And so being able to um, offer that additional service in addition to them using this drill on their own farms makes this project a diversification project and it also makes it pretty innovative as well. So tips for applying for this category. Um, again, emphasize what new product or new service you're bringing to the market. Um, as long as you do that and you show justification for, you know, this is what I'm going to be doing that's new through the completion of this, you'll have a competitive application. For these projects, they're usually very large in scale. So be sure to include in your project timeline that this project is possible to be completed within the 18 month period that you have to complete this. Um, we, it's always uh, a good thing when we see that somebody's really thought out you know, the strategic way in which they should purchase equipment, order supplies, that way things are arriving right as you're ready to install them and move on to the next step of your project. And especially for this category, lots of them involve hiring subcontractors, often many subcontractors to complete the projects. Um, so be sure to include a quote or estimate from as many as you can. Um, and so that's why I'm very glad that this webinar is happening fairly early because especially these days, it seems to be taking quite a few weeks for people to get quotes back from contractors to get them out to learn about the project and give you a quote to do the work. Um, so I suggest that if you're looking to do a project, large scale, big operation with many subcontractors, you know, you aren't locked in to using the subcontractor who gives you the quote, but as long as you have a quote to justify your project total cost, then that's something we like to see. So general tips for applying to any of the transition grant categories. First is to make sure that any equipment is agriculture specific. If it's not agriculture specific, we unfortunately can't fund the purchase of that. Um, so that's why you'll see, you know, we can purchase any sort of ag um, attachment for a tractor, uh, but we cannot purchase, uh, we cannot fund the purchase of a tractor. Uh, we also want you to clearly state how the completion of this project will impact your business. And specifically, we're looking for some sort of statement that involves numbers. We want a quantity. You know, my uh, corn production will increase by 50% in the next year. It can be as simple as that. You know, we don't need something totally, you know, to involve a lot of calculations. And it doesn't have to be exact. You know, um, if this piece of equipment um, you can estimate that it'll increase your production by 25%, include that. Um, it's always good to see those. We want to see those, those numbers in there exactly. Um, also, keep your projects simple if you can. As I mentioned, you have 18 months to complete these projects. And, you know, there's lots of things being backordered for weeks, if not months. Um, so you want to sort of plan for those contingencies that you may have in your project um, and make sure that you can get it done well within your time frame. As I said, you know, connect everything back to production and operation. Um, those words are in the main goal and the statute of this program, so it needs to relate to those two uh, items. And also to check out the application and requirements early. 
Um, even if you're not planning to apply, you know, today, it's better to sort of look now and see what you need to prepare. That way, in January, when you're actually ready to apply, you have your bearings about you and you know exactly what's expected of you. It's a lot harder to, you know, log on on January 10th and look at everything you need to do and sort of pull that all together. Um, and especially even for me, you know, if you ask me, if you call me up on the phone and you ask me questions about the application, nowadays I, I can chat on the phone with you for 30 minutes. But in January, when my inbox is getting flooded with questions from lots of farmers who are interested, you know, there's not as much time to spend on each individual person. So check out the application and the requirements early um, and always feel free to email or call me with any questions. So specifically for 2023, we have some funding priorities. Um, the first are projects increasing the availability of livestock processing facilities in Connecticut. Um, just this past year, Sycamore Farm, they purchased a cryovac and a meat saw to um, improve the production of their processing facility. That was a great project, uh, very well done. So we're looking for any sort of projects. You know, it doesn't have to be a full facility such as Steadfast Farms completed. Anything that would allow you to be able to maybe process some of your own livestock or even offer to process for your neighboring farmers. Anything related to that um, is one of these priorities. And the second are projects increasing the utilization of equipment specific to sustainable ag practices. Um, so the Birch Mill with a no-till drill, um, Fort Hill Farm as well with their crimper and their no-till drill. Um, projects such as those are prioritized. So when you're ready to apply, or if you even want to look at the application um, before you're ready to apply, uh, first is to go to our DOAG website. Um, as I said, if you Google Connecticut Department of Agriculture and click on that link, it'll pull up um, the pages for transition and restoration. So this is the transition page. Um, over on the left, there are a couple categories you can click on. This is the apply page. So on this page, it has a video where I walk you through the application process from last year that you can watch if you sort of wanna get a preview of what the application software looks like. Um, it also has a PDF of instructions, so written instructions if you prefer that watching the video. And also it has the button to link you to the grants portal where you can apply for the grant. There's lots of information on this website, so feel free, you can read success stories from previously completed projects. Um, there's lots of good information. There's FAQs, um, and my uh, contact information is also here as well. Okay, so what will you need to apply? Um, any sort of document or Excel spreadsheet, um, any sort of PDF that form that you might need to fill out is here on the Documents and Forms tab of the website. So we have up at the top, the guidance document that'll walk you through the grant requirements. Um, each application, whether you're a new farmer or you're applying to one of the infrastructure, innovation, or research and development categories, it will require you to answer some questions, you know, type out responses about your project goals, what you're looking to do. Um, so these questions are all available for you here on the website. You can download them. And we uh, suggest that you download the questions. Um, and fill them out on Microsoft Word or any sort of word typing uh, application and have your answers ready when you go to apply. Um, you will be attaching your answers to the application um, on the page. So those, you know, you can start them today if you want and you won't have to log on to the portal to actually submit them until later. Um, they're there for you now if you wanna use them and look at them, see what sort of questions we're asking. Um, so they're there for you to work on. Um, in addition, the budget and project timeline workbook is there. So that's where the information about the cost of your project, um, what it'll cost to purchase your pieces of equipment, what sort of cash match you'll be contributing. Um, these are all available here on the website. So here are the application components, whether you're a new farmer 
they have their own uh, requirements. And then for if you have at least three years of production history and you're applying for one of the other categories, you have your own requirements as well. Um, and something to keep in mind is that if you are farming on leased or rented farmland, um, you will have to submit a template landlord agreement just showing that the landowner consents to you completing the project. Um, so we have that template available on the website as well. So here is an up close image of what the budget sheet looks like. Um, when you download it, it'll um, open in Microsoft Excel. Um, so here's where you'd include any costs of purchasing your equipment, if you need to rent any equipment to complete your project, any materials or supplies you might need to purchase, contractors. Um, if you have multiple more than two, you know, you can go in and add more rows to this table. Um, you'll go in and insert your totals for these and split it up by what are the grant funds paying for and what is your cash match going to be paying for. Um, and we really, this is a very important part of it. You know, if you're not a master at Excel, I totally understand. Um, and that's why, you know, call me and I can walk you through which cells to put things in. That way the equations all work out at the end. Okay, in addition, we also have a budget narrative and a project timeline. So this is more a little in more in-depth uh, explanation of, you know, what are these items? What are they used for? If you have um, any farm employees working on the project as well, you can justify, you know, what are they gonna be working on and for how long? And then, as I mentioned, the project timeline, um, what steps are you gonna be taking um, to complete this project uh, within the 18 months? So now what are we looking for when we review these applications? So for these, um, because I'm very involved in the application process, unfortunately, I don't get to decide who gets awarded because I, I may be slightly biased by my conversations I have with farmers. Um, so we do have a panel of reviewers who are from, um, they're experts in the industry. They come together and they review the applications. So what they're looking for as I've said a couple times, is they want to see that this project will positively impact your farm production and operation. They want to see that these projects will move your farm and business to a new level, you know, to beat the status quo of what you have been doing to bring you to that next level. Um, they want to see quantifiable project outcomes. As I said, the more numbers, the better. And again, they want to see that this is doable within the 18-month time frame. So if you're ready to apply, these are some screenshots of the DOAG grants portal. Um, you head to the portal, you click on all grants. As I mentioned, we have lots of things open right now. So take your time and look through, make sure you click on the one uh, that you intend to. And if you have any issues at all when you're applying, you can email or call me and I will help you through this. Um, we've done, we've had a couple issues. Um, so it's always safe, you know, give me a call and I'll be able to help you. Um, in addition, if, I know you've already sat through one webinar about the Farm Transition Grant, but if you were looking to attend another one, um, next week are the general grant writing workshops. Um, we have an in-person and a virtual option available. Um, so if you'd like to attend another webinar, get some more information, uh, the links to register for those are on the website. All right, thank you guys very much for listening to me. Um, here's my contact information. Um, if you're looking for a quick response, uh, my cell number or email will are the most direct lines to me. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Allie Rose. Um, so uh, we'll open it up to any questions anybody has if you want to put it in the chat section. Um, and while we're waiting for questions to be uh, loaded up, I do have one I think could be helpful for everybody. Um, do you have any advice as far as getting quotes and coming up with costs with, you know, the way inflation is and the way diesel prices are projected to be? Should people overestimate and then backtrack or how, how should that be handled? Honestly, yes. If you are looking to apply and your project doesn't meet the maximum award, I would suggest you factor in 10 to 15% of, of um, 
sort of, you know, budget in 10 to 15% extra because it's likely going to cost you that much extra. Um, you know, when we make these awards in February, we're likely not going to have the projects actually start um, until May. We do go through a contracting process between the awardees and the state, and it does take time to get through that process. And so inflation is, has a big impact. Mm -hmm. um, and so I would say if you have room in the budget, if you haven't already met that maximum award, I say factor in some wiggle room for that. Okay, so would you say it'd be safe to ask not right you don't want to ask any subcontractors to add 10 or 15 percent <laughs> then no matter what that's good what it's going to cost right so right. get your subcontractor quotes and then in your end package ask for that buffer yes okay yeah just yeah. to clarify on that um you know because most of those quotes they're only good for maybe 30 60 days and so it's most likely that their prices will increase by the time that you get to actually starting this project excellent well, not excellent, but yes. Um, are there any other questions? Any of the other? Uh, we still have um, nine minutes left of this question and answer. Uh, here we have a question from Radical Roots. Is this a reimbursement grant? Yes, this transition grant is a reimbursement grant. So what that means is that um, you will not, you know, I, we wish you could, we could give you all the money up front, but unfortunately the money comes at the end after the project has already been completed. So that's once, you know, you've sort of taken on the financial burden of the project to get it done. Um, the money comes after the project is done. Um, I'll come out to look at the project in person. You'll do your final report and then we're able to reimburse you for your grant amount. All right, and uh, can any part of the, this is from uh, Matt Wilkinson, or sorry, uh, Justin, uh, this is from Justin. Uh, can any part of the grant match be our own labor? Can you include labor in your? Yes, so if you, um, if you have to do any sort of site work and you wanna do the excavation or do any sort of the project yourself, um, your time is valuable and you should record that valuation. Um, this would be part of your cash match. If you, the farm owner, are doing any sort of work on the project, your time is under cash match. Um, but let's say you're going to pay two employees to work hours on completing this project. That can be grant funded. So their salary could be paid for with grant funds. Um, so just something to keep in mind, if you're doing the work yourself, um, your uh, time would be under your cash match. Uh, if you're going to pay an employee to do some work on the project, then their, uh, their amount would be grant funded. Understood. And from uh, Matt Wilkinson, uh, because of supply chain issues, at what point in the process can orders be placed? So once your grant application is in, you're awarded, you work with me over a few weeks to get a contract together between yourself and the state. Um, we also involve the attorney general's office for any awards over $25,000. Um, once we go through that process and you have a fully signed and executed contract, that contract will have a starting date on it. So any expenses, after that point, after the starting date has occurred, those are eligible for reimbursement. Now, if you order a piece of equipment and they don't require you to put any money down, you don't pay for it until the project has already started, the contract period has started, that's fine. But if you pay for anything before that contract period starts, unfortunately, any of those expenses are not eligible. Okay. So for instance you could um order or reserve your spot in line for it just make sure you don't pay that invoice until right. after the project starts. if you have to put any sort of deposit down wait until your contract period starts understood um and then uh we have one more not in the chat but um can this i guess is kind of odd um can it be crowdfunded or co farms joining in so two farms say we want to do this project yes i think i got that that's the gist of it um can you know two farms we want to do this and we're going to both 
put up the money because we don't have it individually. Yes, you can do that. Um, you'll have to apply under one of the farms. Um, and I suggest if you do this, um, they're going to require very specific outlining of which farm is paying for which components. Um, so if you are planning to apply in a group or as a partnership, um, make sure you outline, you know, my, I'm going to be contributing this, they're going to be contributing to this part of the project. Okay. So if it's a piece of equipment and you're just going to split the cost 50-50, that's fine. But in some sort of bigger barn building project, we'd really need to have it marked out of who's doing what okay and you would want to i'd imagine you would want to see the benefits of both farms right um absolutely yeah right so you're essentially it's, it's going to be two applications side by side for one grant right so you want to apply once so well yeah in, yes so in that application yes you could talk about this will benefit farm a in this way and it'll benefit farm b in this way understood um from uh gary uh strangle we have uh when you're saying cash match versus grant funded uh you mean the part of the match fund that we need to meet can be paid for by our own labor yes so if the farm owner is working on the project the value of that time spent that is part of the cash match so that even though you're not in theory you know writing yourself a check to do that work the value of that time, you would record that um, and then include that in your cash match. Gotcha. Wow. Yep. So your personal labor is cash match. Labor of your employees can be grant funded. Yes. Right. Okay. Um, any other questions? Three minutes. Simon's a nice guy, he seems like, so I don't mind give him, giving him an extra three minutes. Not that you're not very nice, Allie Rose. Nope, totally fine. All right. Well, I guess if we have uh, no questions, if you think of any um, that you, you know, later on, feel free to, uh, Allie had her email up. And yeah, and I'll put my email in the chat as well for anyone who uh, missed that. Before. There you go. So anybody can reach out uh, later on and make sure if you have that question that we're all thinking of uh without knowing it you know let us know what the answer turns out to be um so next i'd like to introduce uh simon levesque and um hey here we go well thank you um thanks ali uh i think that there's going to be a lot of uh, overlap in some of the terms so uh, I, I may not use the whole time but we will see I'm going to get going here. I will share my screen. How's that look? Okay. So this is going to be for the farmland restoration program. Uh, you guys have already dropped uh, your names, your farms. I saw a couple of folks from Western Connecticut. Uh, this is a farm in Western Connecticut. I always love this picture. So farmland restoration program, a lot like farm transition program, except we have a lower dollar amount. Um, there's the similar eligibility um, in the match requirement expenses are a little bit different. Here's an overview of what I'm going to talk about over the next half an hour. So farmland restoration grant provides matching funds, uh, just like transition. It's a match. So you provide, uh, you purchase and, and perform the work up front, and then we, we will reimburse you. Um, it's open to farmers, nonprofits, and municipalities. And the main goal is to increase food and fiber production. Uh, the, the, the way that we do that is we uh, reimburse you for restoring land into active agricultural production. Um, we focus on restoring and improving land, mainly with prime and important farmland soils. That's the USDA designation. Uh, that's the ones that we like to see restored. Uh, those are some of the most uh, fertile and um, productive soils. Uh, it just as a disclaimer, I guess, uh, restoration grant 
program and any awards are subject to limitations of state funding at the time, right as of right now, we don't have any issues with that. Um, and here's the uh, statute that makes this restoration grant possible. Uh, like I said before, human food, animal feed, or livestock grazing. Keep that in mind. Does your project fall into one of those three categories? So eligible applicants include agricultural producers. You can be uh, just a single or a joint venture. Producers who are owners or tenants. So you don't have to own land. You could be renting. Um, and you have to have at least one year of production, just like uh, farm transition. If you have recently applied for a farmer's tax exemption permit, just provide us with your application for that permit and um, we can work it out. Nonprofits with a property being used for agricultural production are also eligible. We've worked with nonprofits in the past. And then municipalities or state agencies with farmland and use by a farmer. Uh, there's some folks who rent from the town, wherever you may, you may live, or the state. Uh, you have to have a lease that's no less than five years in duration, and it has to have a five-year option to renew. Uh, producers must be registered with the Secretary of State. You can be an LLC or a corporation. Uh, you can be a nonprofit. Like I said, you just have to be you have to either have or be applying for a farmer's tax exemption permit. Uh, farms should be in good standing with the Department of Agriculture, all state and federal requirements. Nonprofits must be registered with the Connecticut Secretary of State. You have to provide us with the IRS exemption letter that they gave. Nonprofits must have three years of consecutive 990 forms on file with the IRS. Um, if you've received grants in the past from Department of Ag, uh, you can have two years in a row, but you cannot have a third year. You'll need to skip a year. Okay. Um, if you're lucky to, enough to have already had two restoration grants in a row, or if you have had a, a transition grant or a viability grant, and then maybe another one, it only applies to Department of Ag grants. Now, if you've gotten grants from American Farmland Trust or USDA, it, it's not the same. Um, we're only talking about Connecticut Department of Ag Grants. So we've split the, the program into two categories here. You have grants that will be performed on uh, private land and then grants that will be performed on publicly owned land. That is to say, if you rent from the town that you're in or from the state, you will have a different cash match. So there's that, that's how we split this one up. If you are just a, a, an owner or a producer who either owns their land or is renting from someone who owns the, you know, a regular you know, landowner, you will be responsible for 50% match on this project. So let's say the project is $20,000 in total you will be responsible for $10,000. If the project is $40,000, you'll be responsible for 20,000 and we will give you 20,000. So it's 50-50 on private lands. Okay, and just as an example, past projects have been land clearing, stone and stump removal, drainage, irrigation wells. That's our really what I call our bread and butter is land clearing, you know, turning land that maybe has become overgrown and, and filled with invasives, turning that into productive. Um, like I said before, if you are renting from either a municipality or from a state agency and you don't own that land, you're going to be only responsible for 10% of the total cost of the project. Um, uh, and we will reimburse you for uh, up to 90% of the cost of that project, up to $20,000. Uh, like I said before, it's it's the same twenty thousand dollar limit for privately owned lands and public lands, uh, just a different match requirement. Uh, where are we here? Yeah, so basically just restating this ninety ten match for publicly owned land and fifty fifty match 
for privately owned land. And once you go into that grant portal, which we'll get into in a second, you'll see that there's two different links. It's just the way that it worked out. Um, most folks are going to be on privately owned land. So you'll use the, pub, the privately owned land link on our grant portal uh, to access that grant. So I'm going to go through what you can't use as a grant match first. Um, a big one, any expense incurred prior to the contract execution. Just like transition, you're not going to be able to get paid for any work that was done before the contract was signed. Um, we, we have to take those contracts very seriously, and um, we can only reimburse you for costs that were associated with the project after that contract start. That will make more sense once we get into the contract portion of it. Uh, once you take a look at that contract. Uh, land acquisition, we don't reimburse for that or mortgages, costs of borrowing points or fees. Um, we don't uh, reimburse for routine business expenses unrelated to the project, okay? Disposable supplies not related legal expenses related to litigation, uh, land remediation, that is to say, you know, a, a cleanup of the of land that was contaminated. Um, this is a land restoration grant, but if land is, you know, was contaminated um, and deemed so, then we, we can't be involved in that. It's not for the use of a big one here, okay? General purpose equipment, uh, not eligible for reimbursement. Transition grant, you absolutely can can use it to for the purchase of equipment um, under the uh, in the ways that Allie Rose um, laid out in her presentation. But restoration grant is not like that. We don't do that. It's it's, it's for the reimbursement of uh, in order to put land back into production. So here's here's some actually acceptable um, expenses. Okay. We will reimburse you for permits related to the the rent or the um, permits related to whatever it may be. You may need to get a permit from the town to dig, you know, a hole uh, as part of your project. You may need a permit for the rental of equipment. Um, you can include that, and we'll reimburse you for that. Hiring contractors—that's a big one. If you need to hire folks to to clear out some trees, if you need to hire folks to you know dig irrigation lines, that's absolutely reimbursable. Soil amendment. Um, you'll see in a little bit, uh, I'll give you an example of, of some of that. Pond, pond dredging, that's a new one. I know we've heard before that folks are interested in, in dredging ponds. We've decided to add that in. Fencing, that's a big one. Um, one, of our, one of our most popular types of projects is clearing and then fence installation. Whether it's for vegetables, if you're going to do a deer fence, or if it's for livestock and you're gonna put in, you know, more simple livestock fence. And here's some other ones, lane clearing, brush hogging, invasive removal. You can do pruning, uh, the edges of your fields are growing in, you can absolutely clear that back. You can even hire a contractor, okay? Field drainage. Uh, employee salaries, payroll are, are eligible for, um, as expenses, okay? It's kind of like transition where you can have it on on the cash on the project. Uh, what, what how should I say the the eligible expenses side of it? You can have employee salaries um, as well as consumable uh, or disposable supplies. Gas and oil, get, it's going up. Diesel, oil, it's all going up, and you, you need it to do any you know significant amount of work on your projects related to the project. You can record the gallons used. Okay but it has to be related to that project. We can't reimburse you for incomplete projects. Got to finish the project as it's written out in the contract, okay? We can, we can sort of, there's a little bit of wiggle room in certain aspects of the contract, not a whole lot. Uh, you'll see, you know, you'll see in what detail it's, it's not, you don't get a whole lot of wiggle room, but you do get some. Um, you can, absolutely spend less. So if your project was budgeted at $10,000 and you only spend eight, um, we'll just prorate the amount down. It's, it's fine to do that. 
Um, but if it costs more, we'll need to have a talk. Um, if not anything bad, we understand that most projects, once they get underway, uh, they end up being a little more expensive. We we understand it's it's just the way it goes. Don't start work on the project until the contract start date. I'd really like to drive that home. I think Allie Rose would like me to as well. We don't like seeing the project start. But we can't have them start before the contract start date. So you've got to keep track of those dates. And if things don't line up, it's not going to go well. So here's a good example. Laurel Glen Farm. I just got these pictures uh, earlier this week. They did a land remediation, not a remediation, a land restoration project with us. Here's the before pictures. They're a mixed vegetable operation. They have some other stuff going on. Here's what it looked like before. You have uh, the, the grading is a little, um, it's just bumpy. Uh, it's very rocky. You can see there's a lot of, lot of stuff in the soil. Uh, it, it may have been used in, in the past, but it's just gone out of use and it's, it's not looking you know, prepped for vegetable production. So here's the before picture. You can even see a little bit of the grade, okay? So on top of it being bumpy, rocky, and, and whatnot, it, it's even got um, a little bit of a grade to it. They regraded it. They stripped the topsoil off. They screened the topsoil all through a contractor. Uh, and then it ended up looking like this. They pulled, they, you know, uh, they rolled it out, made it all nice and flat. They also installed some, some curtain drains, okay? You'll see here, they got curtain drains, uh, you know, following in, in the appropriate place to get rid of that, that water that's running off. Before they installed those curtain drains, they screened that topsoil and then put it back on the field. So they got a really nice field ready to go, ready to plant. They got a uh, drive road here. They planted with rye. And it's a, a, a perfect example of what we like to see, okay? Um, this was a really good project. We like seeing stuff like this. So if yours is like this, I would say, you know, apply for this grant. And... Allie Rose went over a lot of the, the application process. I'll go through it real quick. I mean, um, since this was recorded, you can go back and I, I'll really, really be saying pretty much the same thing. Uh, Service.cp.gov slash DOAG grants slash S slash. You're going to want to go there. You can also find that ctgrown.gov. That's what I tell folks, ctgrown.gov. Go there, you'll find all of the information. This can also be found on the Farmland Restoration Program website at cpgrown.gov. This is an, a list of the application requirements. Last year, I don't know if anybody here applied, it, it was a little tricky with the, with the website. So what we ended up doing is we've moved the majority of the questions to a supplemental application and combined that with the grant narrative. Uh, what Allie Rose was talking about, where she says really, Give us the details on how this is going to impact your farm. That's where you're going to put in to the grant narrative. Uh, there's a space in there. You can fill it out directly in your internet browser, download it, and then upload it as part of your application. Um, we've tried to make it as convenient as possible. We know that um, it, it can be tricky using the online system, but, but this is the best thing going. Uh, budget form is the same as it is for transition. It's got different words on it. Uh, and We'll need some aerial maps. You can get a lot of this stuff from USDA. You can use Google Maps if you're if you're uh, handy with it, uh, or you could go to USDA. They'll help you out. Soil maps. Again, you can do it yourself using Web Soil Survey, and there's links to that in a couple of our documents. Uh, or you can, you know, call your local NRCS office if you're in Western Connecticut. That'll be Torrington. We'll need the tax cards, tax maps. You can go to your town clerk for those. Um, Profit and loss statements. We're going to need pictures of the current project area. And uh, we're going to need profit and loss statements. Like I said before, tax exemption permits or the application. We will need an approval letter if you're renting. And uh, you can find a template for that 
ctgrown.gov slash grants, which to be honest, I don't think ctgrown.gov slash grants is an actual website. Uh, you can give it a try, but I think ctgrown.gov is, is the only thing that'll work. We'll need a copy of your lease and a, a conservation plan or a nutrient management plan if you have one. Again, ctgrown.gov. Here's our grant webpage. It goes over briefly right here, uh, a lot of the stuff I was talking about. Um, documents and forms is where you're gonna find all this stuff, okay? You're gonna find the stuff to download all of it, fill it out, like, unless you don't need the template language. Um, here's what it's gonna look like. Instructions are included in these downloads, okay? Instructions are included. You don't need to fill anything out on the first page, but you'll see the budget sheet Look the same as transition because it pretty much is the same. Um, you're going to need, need to justify the items in this part. This is the budget narrative. So if you buy three hydro flow clear vinyl tubes, quarter inch, 100 feet of them, just describe it. If you bought it online, throw a link in there, put the cost, and then if you're you know, sharing this with another type of grant, put it in there as well. We want to know that. You can include shipping and freighting costs as well. And then here's a timeline. This is good for us to understand exactly how long you think certain pieces of this project are going to take. Um, lay it out as best you can. We're not going to like legally hold you to each step. Um, we we want to see it, you know, completed roughly the way that you planned. Uh, but if things change, that's okay. We want to know what you think your major tasks are going to be because we're going to use that to make the contract. And the contract is going to be the whole binding thing. That's going to be our, our uh, it, it's going to be what we use for your project. All projects must be completed within 18 months. Keep in mind, this application is due December 9th. I'll put that on the screen in a little bit. December 9th, you have to apply by December 9th. I would definitely start it before then, though. Don't be one of those people who goes on December 9th at 3 p.m. has to figure it out in an hour. It's not going to work. Um, I would go ahead, download all this stuff ahead of time. You'll see here all of these documents. Maybe not. You don't have to download all of them, but um, at least download the supplemental application. That's this piece right here on the right. It goes a little further than that. It gives you space to explain. Uh, download, you can look at these example soils, maps, and site plans. Um, download the W9 in the vendor form, fill those out. It's just stuff that you can fill out ahead of time. It's just going to save you time. Landlord agreement, that's where you're going to find that if you rent. Uh, again, W9 in vendor form, we need those to get you on our system, to get you and eventually paid. And then the landlord agreement. Um, it's a competitive grant, so if we get a bunch of applications, we may need to, we may need to choose. Okay, uh, I don't know how it's going to go this year, but it, it's it's a possibility. And the eval the way that we evaluate things is going to depend heavily on the project plan described in the grant narrative. So make sure that grant narrative goes through every part of your project, how it's going to impact the farm, give us figures, you know, oversell it really. Uh, let's see, what do we got? Uh, grant narrative should fully answer the questions clearly and directly. We need to just show us how you're going to get it done on time. Include quotes. Have you gotten quotes over the phone? Write it down. Put a date on it. Uh, we know quotes aren't good forever. Uh, we understand, but you know, write it down. It'll help you too, because if you if you can't, you know, if you don't talk to a contractor for a couple of months. You know, you'll have a quote. Cool, you'll have a quote. You'll say, "Hey, you quoted me eleven thousand in December, November. Uh, what if we got this done? You know, in July. Uh, anything that you think is related to this, just include it in your application. You're going to have to upload it all onto the the website. So it opened October fourteenth, and it's the application period is going to come to a close December 9th at four p.m. Like I said before, just start it before that. You're not going to want to have to scramble. Um, you can anticipate a project start date of April 1st, okay? So I'd say you're realistically looking at things to be to, to get done, start to get done June, July. 
So if your project seems, if, if you think it fits within that, then good, because it's going to take a lot of time to work out that contract, to, to work everything out. We have to have the soil scientist come out. It's, it's a statutory requirement. Um, it's just part of it. The soil scientist will have to, we hire the soil scientist to visit your property, offer recommendations, part of your project. They'll look over the project. They'll say, okay, this looks good. This is not going to, you know, like, you're not going to be like filling in wetlands or like breaking, you know, things like that. You don't want to do, you, you just, we can't have that. So that's why we uh, hire them. And oftentimes they're very useful. You know, we have people like Kip Kolsinskis coming out and he'll offer even a potentially better way to do it. Um, you know, some of these people are, are extremely knowledgeable about the land, so um, they can be a great resource. How do I apply? Same way as transition. Click the apply here button on the farmland restoration. Click apply, that'll show up down here. Before you do that, uh, you can read how do I submit a grant application. We got all the step-by-step -step instructions in here. Read the 2023 farmland restoration grant guidance. Read it. You're going to want to read that. It has all the information that I didn't say today, so I don't have time. Uh, this is what it's going to look like. Click on that. Once we get to apply, it'll bring you here. You got to log in, create an account if you have to. Come back here, apply. Save progress. Ali Rose and I can't stress this enough. Save progress. Here is one thing. Save your progress. It's hard to fit this all in half an hour, but just save your progress. Okay. You, you may have to restart the whole thing if you don't. There's a reason, it'll you know, ask you for a reason to pause, uh, you can put whatever you want there. Okay, this is what it's gonna look like once you pause it. Uh, anytime you have to leave while you're filling your application out, it's gonna take a couple, it may take a couple of days. You may prepare ahead of time and be able to do it one, one sweep, that's, that's fine. Uh, but if you have to pause it, this is what it'll look like. Go back to my grants and then click resume. Again, we got step-by-step -step instructions that go into way more detail than this. Contract starts date April 1st, 2023. That's what we're hoping. We will, we will notify folks in early January. Projects may not begin until the commissioner approves the farmland restoration plan from a designated soil scientist. Uh, contract starts date April 1st. Okay, so I guess with that contract start date, you can expect to begin your work. It says July 1st, really in April and May and June, okay? It really depends on your project. Some projects we're able to, out the gate, just start running with them. Sometimes it takes a little longer to get the soil scientists scheduled. Maybe folks don't have the time. So, I, I mean, I say this, this is a very conservative estimate of July 1st, 2023, okay? Um, December 9th, 4 p.m. 50% match for private property, 10% match for property rented or owned by a municipality. Okay, that's it. Any questions? 